Thank you all for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Sean Cavanaugh. Um, I'm a senior editor for Edweek Market Brief, which is a publication that covers uh, the K-12 market and is really focused on explaining the needs and priorities of uh, school districts to uh, companies and other organizations in the market. Um, but I've also been a reporter and an editor at Education Week um, for about 16 years now. I may have uh, interviewed, I suspect I have interviewed some of the folks in this room at one point or another. Um, I covered a lot, I've covered a lot of beats during my time at Education Week, but I, but I can say that uh, my time spent covering curriculum was, was, was probably the most enjoyable uh, assignment I had. Uh, it, it was sort of this, this boundless area of, um, of, of curiosity, and I, I, I got to talk to a lot of educators who had uh, a lot of passion for what they do and a lot of interesting ideas for how classroom materials um, can be improved. Um, I'm joined by Jack Lynch, uh, the president, CEO, and director of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, um, which he joined in 2017. Uh, Jack has an extensive background in the K-12 education and technology space. Uh, before joining HMH, um, as many of you know, uh, he was the CEO at Renaissance Learning, a company that is heavily involved in, um, in assessment, learning analytics, and other areas. Um, he has more than 25 years of management experience in the software and information industry, um, and he's been involved in the K-12 education industry since 1999. Um, he was the founding uh, CEO of BigChalk.com, where he created an education network um, serving 40,000 schools, and he was later president and CEO of, of the Pearson Technology Group. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to, uh, one housekeeping item. If you have questions, please submit them to the Slido app, through the Slido app. I'm going to be... Um, uh, uh, reading some of those as they come in, as well as peppering Jack with some of my own questions, but I want to make this um, as interactive as we can. And um, let me take an informal poll before I, uh, I start. Uh, how many of you are from um, K-12 districts, your teachers, administrators, uh, working in other capacities? And how about uh, folks from uh, the education industry, companies, and so on? Okay, you're well represented. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so um, let me just start, uh, Jack, with a relatively broad question. I know that you've talked since you've joined HMH about uh, transforming the company, um, which is one of the traditionally thought of as one of the big three publishers into a learning company. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond the sort of the branding messaging of that, what does that mean? What do you hope it will mean uh, in practical terms for teachers and administrators out there? What yeah. was your goal with, with doing that? Yeah, I think you know the strategic journey is to move from publisher focused on great content to learning company focused on great student outcomes. And so that's the overall strategic journey. But how does that, Sean's question, how does that show up in a classroom? Um, right now here in the state of Texas, there is uh, a uh, ELA adoption for reading and for literature and the, uh, this is core curriculum, and in our core curriculum, there will be a computer adaptive assessment that will measure student growth. Uh, there will be the opportunity to group kids by academic ability, and uh, there will be a recommendation engine that will give teachers the ability to identify resources they can target to the individual needs of a group of students or a student. And so when we think about going from great content to great outcomes, it's what, what are the things that you need to do to augment great content in order to produce great outcomes? And it's, you know, it's, it's a rigorous, high-quality assessment, but also high-quality and relevant professional development for teachers. And so <clears throat> for us, bringing those three elements of content assessment, professional development together in a way that feels incredibly useful and practical to a teacher in the classroom is really where the company is focused. Um, let me turn to sort of a big picture issue uh, within the industry, which is I know that uh, Bill Gates has declared the, uh, the death of yeah. the textbook, yeah. or at least it's imminent The death demise. of my company, yes, last week, I think. <laughs> is that right? Not an appealing prospect for a, for a, a yeah. publisher, mm -hmm. I imagine. But um, basically, do you, do you agree with Gates' assessment? And... Um, if not, I'm going to guess that, that 
Perhaps you don't. Uh, yeah. Why not? Why is it, yeah. wh wh what's he right about? What's he wrong about? Uh, first, I want to thank Sean for putting me in a position to agree or disagree with Bill Gates. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I think if you're referring to the textbook as the kind of iconic book that was on the desk uh, in the classroom with the chalkboard and the flag in the corner and the, you know, the, the, the desk uh, neatly arrayed in rows, um, the answer is yeah. I mean, that's, but it wasn't 2018 that that, that product died. Uh, it was long before then. Uh, we have been publishing in both the physical analog medium as well as the digital medium for some time. And, uh, you know, and I think for those teachers in the room, uh, they know that uh, a, the digital path for a core curriculum solution includes very immersive uh, you know, experiences for the students, like using virtual reality to visit a cave in Egypt for a geology uh, lesson. Uh, but also, as I mentioned earlier, using computer adaptive assessment or formative assessment to assess kids and then have it auto-graded so they can get the results and then differentiate their instruction. Uh, or link to a learning management system like Google Classroom so you can you know, manage your assignments. So it's, it's a very different experience that I think a lot of folks think when they think about education, they think about textbooks. Um, the other thing that I think is important uh, is that we're very proud of the, the physical analog book uh, itself. Uh, a little over 50% of students who are in schools today uh, don't have persistent access to a learning device. Uh, and so the classroom for most classrooms in the United States is still a blended learning environment. And I don't think Bill Gates or anybody else would suggest that learning ought to be like a bakery where you take your number waiting for a learning device to be available. Uh, it's, <clears throat> uh, for a lot of teachers, a book is a very useful and practical thing in a classroom. And they use that in a whole class instruction and when it gets to uh, group instruction. Some kids will rotate through computers and uh, along the side of the classroom while other kids read silently uh, at their desk and other kids may be in working on a project. And so that's, the, that's today's American classroom and for those schools that are one-to-one, -one, every child, every student has a Chromebook or an iPad and that's the way in which they want to consume our content and our services. That's great, and a number of school districts do that. Um, but to think about uh, what core curriculum is through the lens of a physical book or it's digital online, I think is limiting. As I said earlier, we're very focused on outcomes. So how can we help teachers improve student outcomes? And uh, we're not so focused on whether they're doing that with digital content or physical content. Uh, one way in which uh, the education landscape, and specifically the, the curriculum landscape, has changed over the past few years is the rise of open educational resources in school districts. These materials created on licenses that allow educators to slice and dice them, um, uh, freely distribute them if they want. Um, any of you experimented with open ed resources in your districts? I see some hands go up. Um, so this has been a you know, big change in terms of the consumption of curriculum, at least in some districts. Um, in fact, one of your big rivals, uh, McGraw-Hill Education, recently announced a partnership to distribute a form of open ed resource. Uh, other big companies, Microsoft um, is now involved in uh, the open ed resource curriculum game. Um, so what's your opinion of the role that open educational resources are having now, um, and, and what will it be going forward, yeah. in your view? Uh, it's a great question. You know, I think there's a lot of very high quality open educational resources, and if you're going to use it to augment a core curriculum, I think that's a perfectly good use case for open educational resources. When it comes to core curriculum, there are open educational resources that will cover math and reading uh, and science uh, core curriculum. And I think the thing there is that it, uh, there are some limitations. Uh, first of all, 
uh, if you're going to use it in the classroom and you have a blended learning environment, you're going to have to pay to have those resources manufactured in a book form. Uh, the second is that most open educational resources organizations that, uh, that create open educational resources don't support, for example, English language learners or they don't support assessment. And so I think while the, the content is, is good uh, and standards align, it's uh, it very often perceived to be an incomplete solution. So for us, open educational resources, as you said with McGraw-Hill, that's a great way to kind of augment uh, what we do. But when it comes to replacing what we're, we're doing day in and day out, um, I think there's some limitations that I think teachers who have used open educational resources are well aware of. Well, so um, do you see open education resources then as a, as a threat uh, to, to HMH? Uh, as a, is there potential for collaboration there? Uh, w w how much of a threat would they pose to, to what you were doing? Yeah, and I think, you know, if you are a learning company focused on outcomes, you're not so focused on protecting the content piece. Uh, you're focused on how that particular solution, and if a part of that solution is an open education resources, so be it. Uh, because ultimately we want to put teachers in a position to help improve outcomes, and it's more than just the content. Um, and so if, if, um, if you were to hear from one of the, the folks in this audience about who says, um, you know, I'm a teacher, I like the power of open educational resources in, in, in my ability to pick and choose and assemble uh, content as I go, um, it, it gives me more freedom than... I can get through buying a, an entire core curriculum through HMH or someone else. Mm -hmm. Your response to, to that is? Yeah, I mean, I think there are teachers who uh, like to curate content and like to be in a position to assemble content on their own for their students. Um, what we find in the market is more teachers than not want to spend time with instruction and with their kids uh, and less time curating. And, uh, and I think the reason for that is not just the time it takes to kind of assemble your own curriculum. It's, you know, for core curriculum, you are, you know, there's not many effective and efficient ways to cover all the standards in systematically over the course of the year to prepare your kids for that, you know, all important end of the year assessment. And so you'd much rather outsource that to a company like ours or our competitors than to kind of insource the creation of your own solution. So I think there are teachers who do that, uh, uh, but I think they are a minority. Um, we've had a question come in, and thank you for the question, about Ed Reports, which is this third-party review site that's out there um, uh, reviewing curriculum. Uh, the question is, how is Ed Reports changing the publishing world quality, procurement, et cetera, um, any ways you think it's, it's limiting your innovation? Just to put this in context, I know that even last week, Education Week reported on Ed Reports releasing these reviews of science curriculum. Uh, they found that just one of six publishers they reviewed, Amplify, uh, hit all the marks. HMH's product was deemed in partial alignment. Four others were deemed not to be in alignment. Mm -hmm. um, so your view of Ed Reports, yep. uh, its its value or lack of value as you see it in the market, it, what, what should its role be, um, and, and what's HMH's response to it? Yeah, I think Ed Reports actually holds a lot of promise as a third party evaluator. I think it's a, a great service to educators uh, to help them decide. Okay, what is the instruct? What you know? What instructional materials do I want to use in our classrooms? And, uh, and in, it measures one particular dimension of quality, uh, and that is standards alignment. Uh, it, it does not measure, nor does it pretend to measure, uh, efficacy or the effectiveness of the programs. So we think standards alignment is a one dimension of quality. It's not, uh, it's not the entire um, uh, holistic measure of quality. We spend a lot of time with researchers in our own research organization as well as third-party researchers uh, doing efficacy studies to see how our programs uh, affect student outcomes. And uh, so I think within that overall context, I think Ed Reports is providing uh, a good service and will continue to improve uh, uh, as a service. 
Um, I think, you know, as it relates to uh, the science curriculum and the ratings that were provided, there are sometimes we disagree with Ed reports. Uh, and this happens to be one of those cases. Um, for next generation science standards, the authors of our next generation science program actually wrote the, the science standards. Uh, and so the rubric that Ed reports use wouldn't have been the rubric we would use to determine the quality of the standards alignment. So that's a case where, I mean, Ed reports allows you to, you know, submit your rebuttal and publish it. Um, unhappily, I don't think many people read the rebuttal. <laughs> um, but I can tell you that, you know, there are occasions where Ed reports will make a judgment that we're not in agreement with. Uh, do you have any sense as to what extent the K-12 administrators out there, the decision makers on purchasing, are paying attention to Ed reports as opposed to other sites, as opposed to sort of word of mouth um, when yep. they're making decisions about curriculum? Yeah, I th uh, you know, I think a brand, reputation, word of mouth are still the principal ways in which people evaluate programs, or we pilot our programs very often. Uh, and then they're used, along with competitor programs, they're used in the school district, and then teachers will determine, uh, along with administrators, what program they're going to select. And, and that's a, a great way to evaluate a program. I think increasingly Ed Reports is factoring into decision making. We've seen, you know, increasing number of RFPs that say, and you must be evaluated by Ed Reports, and you must have this kind of uh, rating. And I think that probably will uh, increase. And that's why, you know, we work. You know, since I've been the CEO, we worked with Ed Reports um, as, you know, as an organization that we think is providing a useful service versus the enemy, uh, who's. Uh, looking to, uh, you know, assail the reputation of our company. Uh, it, let me ask you another question that's come in um, uh, from someone in our audience, Michelle. She asks, um, how does being a, a profit-driven organization impact how your company serves historically under-resourced schools and communities? You're one of the biggest commercial providers uh, in education. Uh, yep. what, what's the impact there? Did Michelle ask that question? Yes. If they saw my earnings last year, they would see that I lost $73 million in cash. <laughs> so uh, now I did it because we did it, because we were investing very heavily in our programs. Um, but I think the, you know, the thing for me in education that's been very important is this kind of uh, fusing together of two things. One is performance, your financial performance as a company, which is important because you have to have an, enough fuel in the tank uh, to achieve the mission, to complete the journey. Uh, and that takes resources. Um, and the other is purpose. And when you put those two things together, purpose and performance, it's mutually reinforcing. A lot of people see those two things as mutually exclusive. But I firmly believe a commercial enterprise uh, can be mission driven as we are and can be successful in delivering on its mission if it, if it has to hold itself accountable to shareholders and has to hold itself accountable to uh, being profitable and being able to invest in products and be innovative. Um, we had a question about state adoptions uh, that came in from our audience. And basically, are state adoptions uh, going away? Uh, mm -hmm. I know that um, in, in some of the biggest markets in the country, uh, Texas, California, and Florida, uh, districts have more freedom to stray from the state adopted list than they have yeah. in the past, but I'm going to assume that you all pay really close attention uh, to those processes. But um, there's been criticism of the state adoption process in the in the past that it, it, it carries too much influence that over the products that get purchased throughout the country. But state adoption, what what's its future and mm -hmm. um, does it have too much influence on the process in terms of what districts are buying in curriculum? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, just a context, a, a great question. About 50% of the students in the United States are in what we call open territory or non-adoption states. And then the other 50% are in adoption states. And there are 19 states that hold adoptions where they evaluate programs and give them their seal of approval uh, after a pretty rigorous evaluation. Um, only three states 
require uh, you to use funding for the adopted programs, uh, Florida, South Carolina, and New Mexico. So for example, Texas, one of the biggest adoptions happening in the country right now is here in Texas for ELA, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and there are companies like uh, HMH who have their programs who've been, quote unquote, evaluated and adopted by the state, the T Texas Education Authority. Um, and the evaluation they do is, is this in alignment with our standards, TEKS, uh, for, um, uh, for Texas, and do, they support, do we support English language learners? And so there's, a, there's all this kind of criteria they have uh, to be adopted. We also have a company uh, called Heinemann, uh, which is a supplemental company that has a unlisted program in the Texas adoption. It's called Fountas and Pinnell Classroom. Uh, and so Fountas and Pinnell Classroom is in this adoption and it's competing with HMH's into reading program and doing it fairly well. And there's, you know, there's uh, school districts that are gonna prefer uh, the, uh, you know, the HMH into uh, reading program over the Fountas and Bunnell uh, program, but it just goes to show that Texas has allowed you to use funds to purchase off-list as well as on-list products. And I think that's what you're going to see. The, the value of an adoption is a very rigorous, process, very rigorous process where the state is going to say, here's our seal of approval. It's not so much propping up companies like ours to provide you know, funding uh, for them. Uh, so I think that's you know, South Carolina, New Mexico, and Florida, you can you buy an off-list program, but you only get 50% of the funding. So right. it's like two and a half states that, that uh, earmark funding for core, uh, core solutions. Uh, if, if you look at uh, some of your biggest rivals, the, you know, the, the quote unquote big three publishers, uh, McGraw-Hill Education has gone through a fair amount of transformation. Uh, they now define themselves as a quote unquote learning science company. Uh, Pearson has announced recently uh, th they're selling off their K-12 uh, curriculum and instructional materials business in the U.S. Um, so given all that change and the change you're trying to bring to HMH, what do you see as sort of the state of the, the big three publishers in the yeah. market today? You know, I think the thing I would say first is uh, it's a little bit of an apples and oranges comparison that we find ourselves in. Um, they are the three biggest uh, education companies in the country. Um, we have that in common. We also have in common that we are providers of core curriculum. But that's about it. Uh, apart from that, we have a very, half of our education business is in supplemental and intervention and professional learning. Um, whereas both McGraw-Hill and Pearson are largely or solution providers. And so I think the difference for us is that, you know, a teacher with 30 kids in her classroom have kids with different academic abilities and different needs. Some of them are on grade level and um, uh, she can support them with grade level content. That's the core solution. Uh, some of them are a couple years behind and she needs an intervention program for those tier two kids. And some of them are several years behind and she needs tier three solutions that would you'd find in our supplemental intervention uh, category. So for us, we are strategically very focused not only enhancing the core solution in the way I discussed earlier, but extending that core solution through these supplemental uh, programs. And then secondly, integrating them in a way ultimately that will be seamless. Uh, the teacher really doesn't care that it's a intervention program or a supplemental program or a core program. She has 30 kids. She's trying to, uh, trying to teach and help, help uh, improve their outcomes uh, and realize their promise as learners. And, and to do that, uh, we want to put her in a position to use data to help her very efficiently differentiate her instruction by group of kids, use an intervention program when appropriate, use a supplemental program for English language learners when appropriate, use an advanced placement program for those smart kids who need to be advanced and accelerated, uh, and do that in a way that doesn't feel like she's jumping from one island where you speak one language to another island where you're speaking another language, but 
do it in a way that feels seamless where you can evaluate the progress that learner is making regardless of what program you're using. Um, we had another question come in about uh, another big name in the industry, Pearson. Uh, the, the person is asking, if Pearson sold for almost nothing, are you worried about the value of your company? Uh, now, point of fact, I think Pearson sold for 200 to 250 million, so it's a bit more than nothing. Uh, may not have been what Pearson thought was fair value, I don't know, but um, how do you respond to that, the value of your company in light of this, yeah. this sale? Yeah, it's a good question. And frankly, you know, I've talked to a number of investors who asked the same question. So it's a, a very good question. I think when you delve a little bit deeper into our portfolio, 13% uh, of our revenue mix is trade publishing. So you go to a bookstore and you buy J.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. That's a book that we publish, right? Or most recently, Friday Black, that's a book that we publish. Or I know there was a session earlier this week in Carmen San Diego. That's IP that we have that we work with Netflix to produce uh, the Netflix animated series. And then the rest of it is an education, and half of the rest of that um, is what we call extensions, but it's supplemental intervention and professional learning. So Heinemann as a company would be in that category, as well as our professional development services, as well as Read 180 if you're familiar with the intervention program, and many other programs. And then we have our core solutions programs that compete with, uh, with Pearson. Um, and so you have to look at our portfolio in its totality. And uh, you know, I think I look at the private market transactions that have happened over the last couple of years, and I look at our $600 million uh, dollar, you know, supplemental intervention business and the margins, higher margins that it has and the higher growth that it has, you know, high single digits last year, uh, it, that business is worth a lot uh, in and of itself. And then, uh, and then if you look at the core solutions business, that would be in addition to uh, the extensions business. So I, I think when you try to do the read across between what happened with Pearson and us, you, you kind of stumble along the way. So let me ask you about that mix of core versus supplemental. I know that you were involved in both areas, um, but this is probably a question for a lot of the people in our audience who, who uh, are maybe making decisions about core curriculum and supplemental curriculum in various subjects, but w what do you see as the mix going forward? This often comes up in our reporting where uh, district officials will, will um, swear by a supplemental curriculum, uh, talk about moving away from a core curriculum. Others say that's the wrong approach. Where do you see this all going yeah. uh, in this landscape? Yeah, I think, you know, think of it as a Venn diagram where there's an overlap in the two circles. Uh, some would say that one is replacing the other. Others would say the other is replacing the other. So for example, if you talk to some of our core solution competitors, they will say they provide as a part of their core solution program in reading and math an intervention solution. I can tell you what they call an intervention solution would not be what we call an intervention solution. Uh, it doesn't have the research to prove its efficacy. Uh, it doesn't allow for uh, kids of all different academic abilities to uh, to, to use a program and then measure their uh, proficiency and growth uh, in a uh, very scientific way. Um, but they still will say, hey, listen, here's our intervention portion of our core solutions program. And then on the other, in the other camp, the other circle, if you will, in that Venn diagram, uh, there are a lot of supplemental uh, providers out there that say, we offer, you know, your core curriculum. You know, why use, why use, uh, you know, a, a textbook or a core curriculum provider. And there, I would say there's not one that I've met that actually does what a core solution will do. Uh, and even, you know, there's other companies other than the big three that have actually produced very good core solution programs, but they are core solutions. They're not supplemental programs being used as a core solution. Um, some of them in OER, for example. Mm -hmm. And the bar is pretty high uh, in core. You, you know, essentially the value proposition of a core solution is equitable access to rigorous standards-based content that prepares students for that accountability assessment uh, done at the end of the year. Uh, there aren't many supplemental providers that can meet that very high bar. 
while many of them say they do. Um, I, I guess that one of the criticisms that I've heard of core curriculum is that, particularly in the textbook era, is that that, that sort of rules overall, and, and the teacher sticks with the textbook, um, you know, the book is the book, and that's what you follow, mm -hmm. but there are others who argue, no, that's, that's in fact a strength, a good core curriculum offers a guide, a roadmap for uh, for teachers, mm -hmm. and they can sort of innovate within that. How do you see it? Yeah, a little bit of both. I think that's you've properly characterized those two views. Um, you know, I think that if you look at it, you know, you probably many of you recall that several years ago we started using this metaphor of the iTunes playlist in education, right? And if you put together all the various songs in you know, lessons, then you could, you know, put together a, a playlist. Um, and I think the right metaphor, if you're going to use a media metaphor, is probably a, the scenes of a movie. Uh, there's typically, in any movie, there's 27 scenes. And the success of, you know, a scene builds on the previous scenes of the movie. And you have the same characters, and you have the arc of a story, uh, and there's three acts, and uh, there's structure to it. And that adds cohesion and relevance and meaning uh, to, uh, to the audience. And the same thing, I think, is true in, in learning. I think if you uh, use a lesson from one program for a seven-year-old who is still working really hard to read how to learn, that has Martians, and then the next lesson has pigs, <laughs> and the next lesson has elephants, uh, there isn't that kind of coherence. There isn't that kind of repetition that comes from a system. Um, now that said, uh, for the teachers in the room, you know, sometimes you have to, uh, if you're in fourth grade and your kids are trying to learn how to add fractions with unlike denominators, some of them don't know how to add fractions with common denominators. So using a supplemental resource for that child at that moment in time is a great thing to do. It's a great way to kind of break out of the system, if you will, uh, and use what you need to use that's going to supplement that grade level content. So I, I do, I think there's, it's a little bit of both, but I think one of the things that we underestimate when we talk about the textbook, and uh, because it's, it's a bit of a red herring argument, uh, we, 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 we lose the sense of that innate value proposition of a system, a system for learning. A coherent system a coherent. is what you would argue, right? I exactly, a uh, coherent system. Yeah, the, um, we've had another question come in about um, sort of the, the future of instruction, in, in particular one technology, uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the person was asking, uh, how do we think artificial intelligence is, is, is going to influence instruction in the future? Um, I can just say, based on our reporting at Education Week, I think artificial intelligence is viewed with curiosity and uh, perhaps more than a little bit of fear um, in the K-12 community. People worried about its impact on teaching um, and in other areas of, of, of uh, instruction. But where do you see AI going in this country in terms of um, three to five years from now, or 10 years from now, what are we likely to see as um, the role that AI is playing yeah. In, in, in schools. Yeah, I, I, let me preface my remarks, my answer to that question, uh, by first kind of laying out what I consider to be dystopian AI. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that, Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> that is in the classroom kind of a steady drip of isolating device mediated learning activities where kids just buy on their own in front of a computer for a good portion of the day. That's dystopian, right? Uh, and the underlying belief there is that AI can replace what a teacher is doing. And for all of us in this industry and all of us who are teachers, we see firsthand the role of the teacher as uh, uh, paramount and the role of the teacher uh, in architecting the learning experience of the kids in her class is paramount. And so, for us at HMH, we look at AI not as a teacher dystopian replacement, uh, but as an extension. How can I help a teacher reach all of her 30 kids? That is a monumental task to begin with. 
And if I can use purposeful technology that has artificial intelligence to help her, then I think that's a good use of AI. Yeah. Um, to shift uh, topics here, uh, we've had a question come in very relevant at a conference where we're talking about issues of equity mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit. Um, historically, here's the question. Historically, those who write the textbooks and curriculum own the lenses. Uh, how does your platform uh, ensure lenses uh, for people of color, women, uh, women uh, LGBTQ, uh, are included? Yeah. You know, I think the, the first answer to that is one of cultural mindset. Uh, we as a company are very focused on diversity and inclusion. Um, and so that's, that's the first thing. Uh, I think second is that we believe, not just myself, but uh, the leadership and the 4,000 of us at h and &H, that one of the major social justice issues of our day is equitable access to high quality learning and instruction, instruction and learning. And that's because today, uh, the average student in the top 100 school districts uh, comes to kindergarten with 1,000 hours less pre-literacy training, which essentially is a parent reading to the child, than their better off contemporaries. Uh, 10 out of 30, or a third of those kids live in poverty. Uh, three out of 30, uh, or 10% uh, live in extreme poverty. One of those kids in that classroom is going to be homeless. Uh, seven out of those 30 kids are going to have suffered uh, chronic abuse uh, and trauma as a result of that abuse. And so it's not good enough to kind of level the, play, uh, play, uh, the playing field and provide equitable access to those kids. They also, by the way, uh, receive 18% less funding, about $1,800 less per student uh, per year. And so we're very focused on how can we help those kids uh, you know, overcome the incredible challenges that beset them because of the circumstances of their birth. They were born in the wrong zip code. And a part of that is programmatically through our professional development. Part of that is through our intervention programs. But I, the, the, it's a part of our ethos as a company to ensure that we're addressing uh, the needs of, uh, of kids who uh, don't have the same advantages as their best, better off contemporaries. And you know, so diversity and inclusion, we have an organization that's focused on ensuring that we you know, have proper representation uh, uh, of diversity in our programs. Uh, one of the things, uh, for those of you who uh, were at our Carmen San Diego um, uh, presentation uh, earlier this week, uh, I met with Gina Rodriguez, who you may know from Jane the Virgin. She was the voice talent of Carmen. And she had the opportunity to uh, uh, act in Jane the Virgin or uh, an Hispanic maid in a, in a movie. And she said, I'm going to do Jane the Virgin, who is an author. Um, because my two, daughter, my two sisters, one an investment banker, another a doctor, I don't see them in TV. I don't see them in movies. And so I, we need to see more people of color uh, represented. And so the, the essence of your question is something that resonates with all of us at HMH, is that we want to ensure these students see themselves in our content. Um, another question we've, come, we've had come in, I know we've talked about OER before, but this person's asking, many times teachers fall back on OER, um, teachers pay teachers, et cetera, because their needs aren't met by textbooks. How are you including teacher voices and needs in your process? What, what role does it, do, do teachers have and, and their specific needs in shaping your product development, yeah. your, your overall work? Yeah, I think that you know the first thing is using um, a product development methodology uh, centered on um, design thinking, human-centered design, using methods like contextual inquiry, where we spend a lot of time walking a mile in the shoes of a teacher to under understand at a very intimate level her pain points, um, and that usually unlocks opportunities or reveals opportunities for us to address those pain points in our products. So I think that's, you know, 
And there are a lot of companies that focus on their products and their features, and then there are companies that really focus on the problems that uh, beset the end user of those products. And that's kind of where we're centered with human-centered design. Um, I know that uh, because there's so many companies here in attendance at this particular session um, and at this conference, um, HMH has the opportunity to partner with a lot of smaller mm -hmm. companies. In fact, you just announced a partnership yep. with a company that's involved in, in, a, in AI. Um, what do you look for um, in a smaller company that, that would be a good prospective partner mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, what they're focused on, their, their innovation, maybe their structure? Uh, what separates a company like that from uh, one that, that you're less high on? Yeah, I think, you know, the first thing for us, uh, most of our partnerships, not all of them, are technology related. Uh, so the first thing is that it has to meet our criteria for purposeful technology, that it's solving a real problem in the classroom. Um, there's a lot of uh, technologies used in classrooms today that are what I would call empty calories. They're not really helping a teacher advance the learning of her students. And so we're not interested in those companies that are really focused on high engagement, uh, but you know, very low uh, effectiveness in terms of improving outcomes. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that the entrepreneurs that lead these companies have deep domain expertise. They've really spent a lot of time with a particular problem, and it's usually a very focused problem rather than a very broad problem. So, uh, you know, the example that Sean mentioned is a company by the name of Amira. And one of the things, for those of you who've been teachers in grades K through three, one of the things you know that you've done is observational assessment. Where kids who are trying to read, you're, how well are you reading a passage? And how many words did you get uh, correct? And how many miscues were there where you had to, you got the, the words incorrect, and there's a timer, and you had to score all this. And the average teacher spends about 40 hours a year doing that observational assessment. So what Amira has done is kind of fused together artificial intelligence with speech recognition technology. So an independent reading assistant can work with a student not only to assess them, uh, but also to help them practice for you know, those words they missed. And so it's not just this discrete activity of assessment. It's it's also helping, uh, helping the, the child learn. And again, we see that as an extension of the teacher. We don't see that as a replacement, we, you know, because the work that an elementary uh, school teacher does in those grades is really fo is focused on reading and as the foundation for all learning. So it's just a small sliver of what a teacher needs to accomplish. But we want to give her those 40 hours back, create capacity so she can do more ha high impact uh, instruction with her uh, with her students. You mentioned this idea of, of purposeful technology, as mm -hmm. you put it. Um, where do you see tech-based innovation occurring right now in, in, in K-12 to the greatest extent, and and where is technology just simply falling short? Where is mm -hmm. it where is it failing schools? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think some of the technologies that are doing incredibly well again, fall into this category of being purposeful, uh, that uh, are solving a problem, and it's really in one of three categories. Uh, solve a problem that creates more capacity, more time for a teacher, that's one. The other is it helps measure student progress, that's two, and does it efficiently uh, without, again, taking time away from the teacher to grade a battery of tests. And then the third is to help you know, uh, differentiate or personalize instruction. So in those three domains, uh, we see you know, companies that are tackling each, each and uh, every one of those domains, not many, but we find disc companies who are focus focusing discreetly on one of those domains. Um, and you know, thinking of companies that have done that really well, I mean, the company that I came from grew tremendously, uh, Renaissance Learning, by focusing on interim assessment and focusing on universal screening, uh, automating the assessment process to provide very rich reporting to teachers without having them to do the by hand grading of, of an assessment. Um, so that's, that's one example I'm obviously very familiar with. Yeah. Um, I'm often surprised in my reporting um, 
but you know, this is a conference. A lot of the, the, the talk here is clearly about educational technology, but um, I'm often surprised by the continuing endurance of, of print um, in classrooms. And when I talk to educators, um, you know, I hear a lot of teachers talking about how they still prefer uh, worksheets, uh, textbooks for certain tasks. Um, and if there are any questions from the audience about, about you know, they get at the, the right mix of print versus digital, I'd love to hear them. But I'm curious, when you're working with districts, um, what is the mix of demand you're, you're seeing in terms of print versus digital? How much um, uh, appetite for print is there in districts, and, 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 and what is the, how does the mix vary mm -hmm. by, by subject matter, mm -hmm. by, by, by type of district, and so on? Yep. There are, you know, there are one-to-one -one school districts that are very focused on not using print. Right? They, you know, they, they want to rationalize and justify you know, that decision. And I think inexorably we're moving to a point in time where school districts and our society will look at a computing device as an essential learning instrument. You know, we're not there yet. So you have to have print materials to compensate for the fact that every student doesn't have access to a computing device. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that I see in school districts, I'll give you just one little vignette. Um, about a year ago, I was with Lucy Calkins, one of our uh, publishers at Heinemann, in a classroom in New York City. And it was a third grade class, and there was an overhead projector, which I remember from my school days, uh, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. <laughs> uh, and. I thought, wow, it's an odd to have that technology. And it was, con it was, it was linked to um, a screen. And the teacher was going through a book. It was a picture book. And she put the pages on the overhead projector, and they showed up on the screen. And all the kids in the class that were sitting Indian style in kind of a semicircle. And, uh, and then you know, she read a chapter, and she said, she asked the question, she said, now I want you to pair and share. And I want you to know, I want you to tell, uh, tell me what was the main character's point of view during this particular chapter and provide evidence as to why you answered the question in that way. And it was an amazing thing to see the hand shoot, shoot up after they had paired up and just the interaction and the social discourse that happened in that classroom. And the one thing I walked away with is there's nothing that technology could have done at that moment in time to improve that learning experience. Um, and I think we just need to remember that teachers are, they're not focused on whether it's digital or it's computer or focused on print, whether it's books. They're really focused on their kids and their kids' learning. Uh, and so I think we have a temptation in our industry to look at learning through the lens of digital or the lens of analog. And really, I think we have to look at it through the lens of the teacher and what they're trying to accomplish. And I think most teachers really don't give a damn if it's online or if it's a physical book. They just want their kids to have the best learning experience they can. Uh, one of the, the, clearly, the main areas of focus, one of the big demands that, that is coming up in districts around the country is uh, th this focus on student well-being or social-emotional learning. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of panels here at this conference on this topic. Uh, we hear of um, districts having this strong appetite for uh, products and services and social emotional learning for solutions that will work. Um, this push for SEL, how is it influencing uh, your company's work in terms of uh, you know, product development, your overall strategy, mm -hmm. what you're thinking? What are you hearing from districts and mm -hmm. how are you focused on SEL. Yeah, I think you know there's a big emphasis, especially over the last couple of years, on SEL appropriately. And uh, you know we're very early in it, to be candid with you. Uh, we're at the point in time we're evaluating a lot of various companies and organizations that are out there. Uh, we're, we're working with acad academics who have invested a lot of their research in social emotional learning. And I think where you likely you likely will see social uh, emotional learning land um, as kind of the tip of the spear for HMH is in our professional development organization, uh, and maybe not so much as a product as it would be a service uh, uh, that uh, we'll employ for educators. 
uh, and uh, the person who heads up professional learning at uh, HMH is a lady by the name of Rose Eltz Mitchell, uh, who uh, conducted a session earlier this week at South by Southwest EDU. And she is very focused on finding the right partner or partners uh, that we can work with for SEL. So we're kind of in that investigation stage right now. And in professional development, uh, the reason being that, that simply teachers need a lot of help in figuring out um, what, how they're going to work SEL into the classroom? Is that I, what you're thinking? I think that's a part of it. Also, when we think of professional development, it's not only teacher training. It is... Uh, you know, system-wide school reform. So our International Center for Leadership and Education uh, is very focused on consulting services to for educational leaders and helping, you know, helping to, you know, improve student outcomes. Uh, and so that you would see it as a consulting uh, uh, practice, if you will, uh, within within ICLE as well as uh, teacher training. Uh, one of the main goals of a conference like this is to. Um is to try to allow uh, educators to talk about innovations in their classrooms. And clearly, there are a lot of companies that are uh, betting that they're going to produce the innovations that will appeal to educators. Um, it's one thing for a startup company to talk about innovation. Mm -hmm. It's another, another thing for a big publicly traded company mm -hmm. that has these legacy products in the field, like yeah. HMH. Um, so, What's the biggest challenge you face in trying to bring about innovation within a company um, of your size and scope and reach in school district? How, how do you do that? Yeah. You know, I think the biggest challenge uh, that I faced when I joined HMH was talent and mindset. So all of us know large companies that are innovators, right, that are serial innovators, Amazon, Google. So there isn't, it isn't, you know, small, nimble versus large, you know, not so nimble. It's more of mindset and talent. Uh, the team that we put in place is a team of innovators. They think of disruption. They think of those pain points I talked about earlier through uh, human-centered design. Uh, and they understand that that's, where, that's the wellspring of innovation is really focusing on those pain points to help. Uh, help educators uh, improve student outcomes. So I think for us, it's mindset, it's methodology, uh, people, the right kind of innovative processes, and ensuring that a certain percentage of our revenue every year is you know, products that were created in the last two years. Um, I know that when you took over at HMH, uh, you made some changes in, in management and structure in your various teams. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, uh, with a company of your size, what's the most legitimate criticism that, um, that you received that, that you thought, okay, this is on point, we need to make a change in this area? Mm -hmm. And then you went about and, and actually made a change on the basis of that, that criticism. Yeah, I think that if you looked at when I arrived, you looked at core curriculum, um, one of the biggest criticisms in interviewing teachers was that, hey, listen, uh, I got to use this for six years. And in the first year, it's great. I like the program. It's very engaging. Love it. Second year, you know, feels good. By the third year, you're kind of tired of the program, you know. And then by the fourth and fifth year, you cannot wait until there's a new program. And so that's probably for core curriculum, that's probably the, the biggest criticism that we receive from teachers because they don't want to use the laminated lesson plans, right? <laughs> they don't want to, not that we produce those, but they don't see themselves as, you know, uh, the medium through which, whoops, excuse me, the medium through which they uh, impart knowledge. Um, they are human beings that are really working with each and every child to help them realize their potential. And so I think that has been the, uh, one of the biggest criticisms. It's a feature of our industry. Uh, we got back to you know, the adoption process earlier. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing right now is evaluating that and say, hey, listen, is there, you know, we know that the world doesn't stop spinning on science for six years until our next new program comes out. Um, there's innovations. There's 
uh, breakthroughs in science every week, every month, every year. Um, the same is true, believe it or not, in English language arts. You know, we're very focused on balanced literacy right now. Seven, eight years ago, we weren't. Same thing in math. We're very focused on having more inquiry-based instruction rather than uh, direct instruction. Um, so those things change over time, and we want our core programs in the future to reflect those kinds of changes. So I think what you'll see, not, not necessarily this year, but in the future, having us move to, instead of these episodic development efforts for a big adoption, you'll probably see more continuous delivery of our programs where they'll always be new because we're refreshing the programs as we go along. Uh, and that, you know, there's things that we'll need to do to make that happen with states and how they procure instructional materials or evaluate instructional materials. But I think that's a part of our opportunity. That wasn't so much an opportunity when you just provided your instructional materials in book form, right? Producing an every, a book every year is a, a pretty big expense. But when you provide it through the digital medium, you can look at, you know, you can look at how the content is being used and what produces the best outcome and then use that recursive feedback loop to enhance the overall quality of your program. So I think that's the biggest criticism. Uh, that's not the only, uh, but I would say that's probably the chief criticism and that's the way we're thinking about solving that problem. Um, another question that came in from our audience um, about uh, the focus of curriculum. Uh, to what extent should uh, K-12 education shift from a broad academic focus uh, to job and career uh, preparedness specifically, um, mm -hmm. the future of the workforce and so on. It, 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 to what extent is that an issue that, that you all are considering uh, yeah. in your shaping of curriculum and other products? Yeah, you know, I think the, when you look at the standards and uh, the creation of the Common Core, there was great intention around college and career ready uh, to the point where in English language arts, we wanted to ensure that we you know, dialed up the amount of nonfiction that kids were reading so that when they got into the workforce, they could read a technical manual and think critically about the work that they were doing. Uh, so, you know, I feel good about the standards movement, how it's evolved uh, to address not only those kids who are going to go on to a uh, four year college, but two year colleges or vocational schools. And I think there's more opportunity to do that. I think the one hesitation I personally have, and I'm not representing HMH, uh, but as a former English major, I think learning how to learn is something that's important. Th thinking critically uh, is something that serves you well throughout your entire life, not only in your work, but in your life as a citizen. So I would just want to make sure that we don't go back to um, a place when we were at the end of the, you know, the. Uh, uh, 19th century, uh, John Cardinal Newman was lamenting the fact that uh, we were turning universities into voc vocational schools. And there's appropriately, we'll have vocational schools, but you know, we ought to ensure that universities uh, still have you know, the classics and liberal studies as well as, as uh, you know, majors that are more vocationally oriented. Uh, great. We are um, at the end of our allotted time. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming and thank you for the terrific questions. And if you'll, you'll join me in uh, thanking uh, Jack Lynch for his comments today.